Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our final um, um, show, our final Minicon series. It's really exciting that this is um, that this is happening. And uh, we're running a little bit late because, you know, technology and me, that's the thing, right? So I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to actually, we just actually, um, oh, the um, Jason Rodriguez was in the waiting room about a minute ago, and now he's gone again. So <laughs> I'm going to um, ask them to um, ask him to rejoin. All right, and he rejoined now. All right, so um, Jason should be with us just in a second. So I'll do a little bit of business. Um, before Jason comes on. So again, welcome to the, the sixth um, week of our Minicon series. You sort of think I, we would have had the tech down by now, but you know, I just, you know, the tech gods are not with me. But anyway, we're here now. So um, as you know, we've been um, selling the, um, the masks and, um, and actually right now the rainbow one is, is sold out, but we're getting some more in. Oh no, they're in. So we're we're uh, they're on the way. So um, there's the rainbow ones. There's um, the um, asexual ones. There's bi ones. There's pan ones. Um, so there's a whole bunch of and there's lesbian ones. So there's a whole bunch of of masks. And, um, and we've talked about that before. So I won't um, I won't bore you with telling you about it again. Um, the link will be in the in the the notes so you can see that. We also added um, shoelaces. So we've got um, in uh, four different um, styles. We have shoelaces. The shoelaces are eight dollars each. The the uh, masks are on a sliding scale between um, ten and fifteen. You can pay what you'd like, and all that money goes to support True Colors youth programming, which is very exciting. So um, we um, hold on one second. Let me just send that. Um, we are very excited. Um, that this program has been going pretty well. If you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, I hope you'll do that. It's True Colors Inc. Um, it's called True Colors Inc. Premier Channel. And if you could uh, subscribe to that, the more subscribers we have, the more access to features and ability to, um, to show different things to different people. So um, that would be really cool. The other thing is that if you haven't had a chance to be up on the YouTube channel yet, you should really check it out. There's dozens of really good workshops from all different kinds of presenters on all different kinds of topics related to LGBTQ plus um, youth concerns. So there's, there's workshops for um, about school, there's workshops about pronouns, there's workshops about um, adverse childhood experiences and that connection to um, LGBTQ youth. There's information about um, um, the Journey Riders, which you're going to hear about a little bit today. There's information about uh, Sarah Prager is going to be on in a little while, and she talks about uh, queer icons in history. A little bit later today, uh, Nicole Talbot will be on. Um, she is a young musical theater actress um, that she's a rising freshman at Boston Conservatory, and she's going to uh, sing and then um, you know do a little Q and A. Um, with us. And then right after we talked to Jason Rodriguez, who apparently is running pretty late, um, right after we talk with Jason, we're going to um, talk to two members of the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus, and they're going to be talking about the choral movement and its relationship to queer culture. As you know, today's theme is really queer culture. Um, and so all of the people that will be on today will have talk about different elements of queer culture. Uh, we'll be talking with black queer writers. Um, we'll be talking with, you know, historians, the choral movement, um, and also sort of the drag and ballroom community. So um, Jason is not um, is not on yet. I'm going to show a piece of his. Um, actually, maybe what we can do is switch and see if um, Robert and Patrick would be willing to come on early while we're waiting for Jason, um, because we have such a tight program today that, um, that
that I'm, I'm worried that we're running behind. So let me um, ask Robert if they will come on early and, um, and we'll see what happens from there. Hold on one second, sorry y'all. So I just asked Robert if he wouldn't mind coming on early and then we'll bring Jason back uh, when he is able to call back in. Um, so let's see, he's typing a response. So you don't usually get to see the behind the scenes um, stuff. And he said, sure we can. So I'm going to admit um, Patrick McGrady and Robert Reeder to, our, um, to the room. And um, Patrick McGrady, uh, who will be joining us in a second is an assistant professor, there's Patrick, an assistant professor of sociology at the University of New Haven and an active singing member of the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus. He teaches a broad range of courses that include sociology, deviance, I want to take that one, social inequality, and statistics. He researches and writes on the intersections of sex, gender, sexuality, identity, and stigma resistance. Most recently, he's been working on a project about the LGBTQ plus choral social movement in the United States and how membership in such organizations helps individuals construct an activist identity, cultivate social support and a coherent sense of self. Joining Patrick is Robert Reeder. Robert is the co-founder founder and executive director of the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus. He's currently the education programs manager at Hartford Stage and holds a BA in drama from Ithaca College. He served on the board of directors for the Connecticut Dance Alliance from 2008 to 2015. He's the recipient of the 2012 Barry Award for Outstanding Service and Dedication to the Hartford Stage. And we're really delighted also to say that, that um, Robert is a True Colors mentor. So that's exciting. Welcome, welcome gentlemen. So um, I know you're gonna be talking about the, um, the choral movement and that you have, I understand Patrick that you have a, um, a PowerPoint. Yes, should I share? Uh, if you want to, you can go ahead and share your screen. Once you share your screen, I'm going to, to, to take myself out of here um, and then, but I'm still on here and I'm still in listening so I can come back anytime, all right? I just don't wanna, um, I don't wanna take up space for your video. So, all right, you ready? Go ahead. Hi. All right. Patrick, you want me to start? Take it away, Robert. All right. Well, hi everyone. Um, happy Pride and um, my name is Robert Reeder, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus, and we're really thrilled that we could be with you this afternoon. We always enjoy uh, being a part of the True Colors LGBTQ Youth Conference every March, where we have a workshop and, and perform in the closing ceremony. So it's great that we can share with you today, even if it's virtual, uh, just to share some highlights about the Harper Gay Men's Chorus. I just want to briefly just tell you quickly how we became about. Uh, this an interesting story. We actually started out uh, as an idea. Uh, the co-founder, J.D. Bauer, and myself sat at a kitchen table and we discussed starting the Harper Gay Men's Chorus back in April of 2012. And at the time, uh, we'd had no idea what was going to happen, and uh, our only means of communicating and sharing that we were starting a chorus in Hartford uh, was through social media on a Facebook page we created. And to our surprise, we ended up with 24 singing members in that fall concert cycle. Uh, and uh, we performed in December of 2012, and we were sold out. We actually had to turn people away. Um, and this was at the Unitarian Society of Hartford, which is our home base and our rehearsal home. And we've been with them for the very start uh, of the chorus. So part of the reason uh, JD and I wanted to start a chorus, we thought there was a need for a chorus in Hartford. Uh, both of us have, were involved in the arts and we thought this was a great opportunity to bring us together and to create a safe space for members to be able to sing, express themselves and have a, 
uh, social network, and more importantly, to have a family. So here we are, we're in our eighth season and every year uh, our course uh, it, it grows in numbers. Uh, we have between 50 and 60 right now and that includes not only singing members, but our G class, which are our volunteers. And we couldn't do what we do without them. So um, I just wanna, uh, I see that the first slide is up and I wanna just read that and then give you my thoughts. So if you want to sing, join a chorus. If you want to change the world, join a gay chorus. And that rings so true, especially right now in light of everything that's going on in our country with COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and social justice. So, you know, we use music as a catalyst to inspire not our members, our patrons in the community, but also it's a way for us to inspire and change the lives of others. And it gives um, patrons and other individuals an opportunity to think about things differently. So many of the songs that choruses perform have lyrics that are so moving and touching that relate to current events that are going on. And so I think, and I know this, that we will continue to march forward in what we do in our community outreach. And we will also help in the fight for social justice as well. So with that said, I know our time is limited. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Patrick McGrady, uh, a singing member and a really good friend of mine. So Patrick, would you take it away? Thank you, Robert. Um... Yeah, I, you know, I was at that first show in the audience, um, and um, I didn't become a singing member until 2015, but uh, uh, my partner joined up right after that sh first show, and um, I've been, it's been really great to be a part of this organization. Um, I like this quote a lot, too, because I think it sums up the arc of the social movement. Um, you know, you might have seen lots of uh, courses at Pride events, um, on television, especially when we have momentous sort of uh, uh, changes in, in LGBTQ rights or tragedies. Um, and what we wanted to do today is kind of situate where we currently are um, versus the history of the social movement. So, um, I want to give a quick shout out to our social media director, Josh Burkhart, who actually um, kind of curates all of our pictures here. So uh, between him and the magic of PowerPoint, that's, just, just, that's what created these slides. So thumbs up to Josh Burkhart there. Um, so it's been really important to kind of think about where this movement began. Uh, we can kind of go way back to the uh, late 1970s, um, and the movement was born out of resistance. This was a radical movement and a radical time in general for gay rights in the United States. During this era, this particular decade, uh, kind of opening up with the Stonewall riots of 1969 to the demedicalization of homosexuality in the mid-70s to the first uh, pride parades and events to closing out the decade with the uh, HIV AIDS crisis, um, it was a tumultuous but radical time for LGBTQ rights. So choruses uh, kind of coalesced around these, um, these, these certain, these issues, particularly women's rights, gay rights, and um, sort of the ignorance of the state uh, regarding HIV AIDS. We also, or the choruses, choruses as a movement also, uh, coalesced around um, uh, states uh, that had laws and, and uh, uh, a policy that allowed for free and open discrimination against LGBTQ individuals. And that's a really important point because you had the creation of these organizations where if you were caught publicly performing, you could lose your job, you could lose your house, and potentially lose your family. So we were born out of resistance, um, which means that choruses, especially during this time, were not just about um, uh, singing. Um, choruses were also about uh, creating family and creating social networks, 
And they were also a place for, for individuals to process their emotions around the LGBTQ movement uh, and discrimination. The first chorus to have gay in the term and their title was the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. Actually, their first performance was on November 27th of 1978, where they were performing uh, at a public memorial uh, uh, for uh, Harvey Milk, who was the first openly gay elected official in the state of California, along with um, uh, the mayor, George Moscone, Moscone, who they both were executed, or not executed, they were um, uh, assassinated by, a, um, by a, a fellow city supervisor there. So their very first public performance was very much about activism, representation, uh, and uh, getting the word out that this inequality exists um, and we will not stand for it. So what kind of launched from that? Um, cities became incubators for, for gay choruses um, uh, um, and they became places for people to form healthy social networks. Um, a study of, or sort of a case study of the early San Francisco Chorus revealed that many folks came to the chorus not just because of their interest in music, but because they were looking for friends. They were looking for a family, um, and some of them actually were looking for job opportunities uh, and social networks to hook them up uh, through that. And from that, from that movement, uh, you also had the creation of more kind of queer-based art and performance, early protests, and performances were around sort of uh, spotlighting the issues of queer individuals as well as women's rights. And Robert, feel free to jump in at any time you want to. Okay, <laughs> you're, you're doing a great job. <laughs> I tend to ramble on when it comes to, to sociology. <laughs> um, so if we kind of think about the forward motion here um, of the movement, the 1980s um, was a big moment of growth for the, the social movement itself. Um, 1980s, early on, we were in the midst of the HIV AIDS pandemic. Uh, we were existing in a um, state institution that largely did not recognize the rights of LGBTQ individuals um, and discrimination was a legal thing. 1983 brought about uh, the first national chorus conference. 12 choruses participated at the Come Out and Sing Together Festival, also known as the Coast Festival. And that um, was a foundation for the creation of the modern gala movement. Um, the gala movement uh, is a collection of North American choruses, uh, LGBTQ choruses, as well as ally uh, choruses, youth choruses, um, uh, and it has its starts in the start here in the, in the early 1980s. The gala movement itself and the gala organization uh, provides a whole uh, bunch of resources for gay choruses. Uh, it is a place where you can find libraries of music that was, has been created as part of this uh, movement. It's a full on um, organizational structure uh, with people who can help with leadership, with directing, uh, and basically how to start your own uh, gay chorus. Um, we, as an organization, the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus, uh, had the privilege of attending the 2016 uh, Gala Festival out in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we were supposed to be, I believe, next week, actually, yes. heading yes. out to Minneapolis for the 2020 Gala Festival. Um, but as we all know, singing is a very high risk um, um, activity during this time. Uh, so unfortunately that has been postponed to next year. So hopefully this time next year, we'll be gearing up to head out to Minneapolis. Um, that photo up here is sort of our, uh, our debut. We were uh, a little bit smaller than we are uh, today. I think we've almost doubled in size actually. Yeah. Um, and GALA currently is about 190 and growing uh, organizations. And 190 might not sound like a big number, uh, but that includes 10,000 plus singing members, associate members, boards of directors, and so on. So it's a massive social movement here. Robert, do you want to say anything else about GALA? Um, no, I think you covered it. And uh, we're looking forward 
to being on the stage for Gala Festival next year? Yeah, uh, I hope so too. I'm, I was very bummed out when it, but it's- Me, me too. Um, but one other thing that I want to kind of mention here um, about the social movement itself is it was not born on its own. Many social movements, uh, particularly minority rights movements, um, are kind of interconnected. We draw on similar rhetoric from each other. The kind of growth of the, of the gay choral movement actually owes a lot to one, the HIV AIDS activism, as well as the women's rights movement, particularly that second wave feminism movement um, where many choruses kind of um, collected around those rights kind of you know, develop a common narrative of otherness and began to act against that. So, which gets us to where we are today. Now, one thing that I think Robert and I want you both to know is that you don't have to be gay to be a member of the gay chorus. Many choruses, Hartford Gaiman's chorus included, is while well, we, we accept all identities, all expressions. Um, you know, I think the only requirement to sing is, is as if you can carry a tune in that uh, uh, tenor bass baritone range. But even if you can't carry the tune, we have lots of uh, volunteer opportunities. The movement itself, we are kind of in this, this era of we have marriage. We just, you know, couple uh, um, uh, during this past month uh, have, um, uh, are included in, in workplace discrimination um, uh, prevention. Um, but we have miles to go on certain uh, issues. And so Robert and I kind of wanted to talk about sort of where we see things as going. Let me kind of give you some examples of what other courses have done to, to, to do their activism. Um, in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombing back in 2013, the Boston Gaiman's Chorus actually uh, formed a tour of the Middle East as a sign of, of unity and understanding. Um, in the wake of the 2016 election, um, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus actually planned a tour of a lot of the red states in the South to kind of uh, build a bridge of dialogue between people who might be fearful or un unaccepting of LGBTQ individuals and ourselves. Um, we saw in the wake of the Pulse nightclub shooting four years ago, many choruses coming out to support their communities, to sing, uh, to offer help and volunteer. And again, that function of it being more about than just music still remains today. Um, so we are a resilient movement, not just in terms of politics and, and, and discrimination, but even in the context of COVID-19, we have found ways to create community, much like this, this conference. We have found ways to get together, to create music. I believe you'll be seeing a product of that uh, pretty soon during this session. Um, so we are a movement of resilience. We're also a movement of authenticity. Many choruses exist in my own kind of, when I'm thinking about my own research is that they exist also to help people who join to really kind of be who they are. A few years ago, I got to attend um, a show by the New York Gay Men's Chorus and their executive director came out on stage and mentioned that when she comes to watch rehearsals, she sees these individuals come into the space, they remove their coats, they drop their bags, and they become who they really are. They kind of drop that, um, that worry of, of being discriminated against or, or they're able to fully be themselves in this space. And that is especially true for the Hartford Amens Chorus. Robert, feel free to, if, if stay here. I'm still here, yep. So um, do you want to say a little bit about sort of, you know, what you envision as the movement moving forward? Sure. I, I feel, you know, um, um, we are very active in our community outreach. We want to be visible to the community. We want to support our community. And as I mentioned earlier in my introduction, we want to inspire and change the lives of those individuals. And we're also, perform, we're also providing a platform of education outreach in the community as well. And I really feel strongly about that. And I think our chorus does a really good job uh, bringing that to our community. And, in, and 
also supporting some of the things that are happening in our political arena right now is some of the marches, some of our members, including myself, have participated to show our support. So um, a lot of uh, talk within the gala choruses is while we may not be able to get together, what can we do moving forward to uh, help support the social justice movement that's happening uh, in our country? So that's, that that's, is uh, to be determined, you know, as we, as we work through the next few months, we'll lay out our plans of how we're gonna move forward in this time of, of virtual rehearsals and virtual connection uh, as, as a singing group. Yeah, I, I like that you mentioned the education element, uh, Robert, because one thing that I really like about the, um, the, the, cor the gay choral movement is all the works of music that have come from that. Um, you know, attending the Denver uh, Festival, I saw so many stories um, that was just demonstrating what it meant to be a member of the LGBTQ community. And the realization there is that there's no single story of mm -hmm being gay, being trans, being bisexual, asexual, or what have you. Um, um, and that thing that's uh, been a really great kind of contribution of the movement. Um, there's been some pretty fantastic um, music that tells stories um, um, in a really unique and creative ways. Mm -hmm. I agree totally. And I think we were one of those choruses that provided the work of Two Boys Kissing, which told an amazing story uh, for us uh, to be able to perform that live on stage was so different from what we've done in the past. So I just want to just touch upon that there is more work to be done. And I alluded to that. Um, and I want to just say, while we have some, while we've had some small victories, we still have a lot of work to do uh, as a community, as a, in, as a, a chorus and the gala choruses organization, uh, we still have a lot of work to do moving forward. And so there's our, uh, and, you know, if you're interested, this is actually the most recent uh, group photo of us um, uh, that we got at least. Um, but all of our, our social media is there. Um, Robert, do you want to say anything about this? Sure. I want to just say uh, thank you, everyone that's listening and watching for this opportunity to, uh, to talk to you about the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus. And I just wanna say, uh, we would love for you to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We are at HGMC Sing. So please join us there. And I also, we may not, you may have some thoughts about what you heard Patrick present or anything I may have discussed. So we welcome you to submit any questions or thoughts about what you heard today. My email is right there, Robert Reader at R-R-E-A-D-E-R -E -E at hgmc.org. So please feel free uh, to send that information uh, my way and we'll get back to you. And come sing with us too. Yes. If you're 18 or older, you're welcome to come and audition and be a part of our chorus family. We'd love to have you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. This was wonderful. And, um, and I'll have at the, at the end of the, the show today, um, we're gonna be showing um, a, a, a performance that they put together remotely. Um, that's really quite special. It's called, you know, it's Bridge Over Troubled Water. It's beautiful. Um, we're going to show it here, and then it's also been uploaded onto the um, onto our website, onto our YouTube channel, so you know um, people can enjoy it over and over, like I did. So, um, thank you so much, and um, and we hope to um, talk with you again soon, and hopefully we'll all be able to get get together and sing, um, you know, sometime soon. So, um, thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Robin. All right. See you later. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Uh, hey, Mel. Hi. So um, Jason hasn't come on yet. He was supposed to be on at 2.30. Um, and so we've got a little bit of time to fill. And I would love for you to talk with our folks about Queer Academy, especially since um, um, people are getting their applications in now and it's live streaming on the, the, 
the um, YouTube channel, I mean, the um, Instagram channel, which is the GSA channel. So go now. Yay. Cool. Okay. Um, so as we all know, coronavirus has totally screwed up everyone's plans all over the place. So we are planning on holding it. Hmm. Planning on holding Queer Academy on Zoom this year. So it's going to look a little bit different. We're running the same kind of general concept, six weeks, social justice focus. We are adding a um, STEAM focus this year. So science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. I'm really proud of myself. I got that right. Um, which means, so on Mondays, we will have a two-hour animation class being taught by somebody who teaches graphic design at a high school. So someone who knows what they're talking about with technology, not me. Um, who will be teaching us how to create animations of our own using free software. Then on Wednesday, we will be spending the same two hour time period with different guest speakers every week from Hartford and the surrounding communities, um, artists, activists, educators, people who use their skills and their interests to promote and forward and fight for social justice. That means all kinds of things. I'm hoping to work with a couple rally, rally organizers, um, a couple drag performers who fundraise for things like the bail fund, all kinds of different folks who are from different kind of walks of life and different interests and how they use those interests to support the work. So those will be Wednesdays. Um, we were talking about doing these in the evening, but we're starting to talk about maybe shifting to the morning. I'm going to include that question on the survey. So when you apply, young humans who are watching this, um, there will be a question asking you which time periods would be best for you. I can't promise that's when we'll do it, but if everyone but me would rather do it in the morning, I will do it in the morning. Um, the link will go up on Instagram probably later today, and it will be in the GSA newsletters and things like that over the course of the next couple of weeks. It starts July 6th, and we hope to see you there. You're muted. You go into the website, OurTrueColors.org. Um, you can go into the, the Queer Academy and all that information is, um, is there. The application's there, the link is there. Um, and so, you know, come check it out. And um, thank you so much, Mel. Mel, by the way, uh, runs all of our youth leadership um, stuff, works with GSAs and the, the youth team all year long. So um, thank you very much, Mel, I appreciate it. And um, joining us now, is Slim Extravaganza, <laughs> although I don't actually see his video yet. Um, and that um, this is Jason Rodriguez. Um, and so hold on one second, I have his, um, so I'm gonna read this because I thought it was really, I loved it. So Jason Anthony Rodriguez is a Dominican American actor dancer. He was born and raised in Washington Heights in New York City, um, went to SUNY Purchase, um, where he received a BA in arts management while also studying dance. He co-stars in Ryan Murphy's Emmy and Gold, Golden Globes nominated show Pose and, and plays Lamar Wintour. He is also the movement coach and choreographer for season two of Pose. He guest stars on the season finale of The Deuce as on HBO as Enrico. He's been featured in the New York Times four times by Siobhan Burke, Gia Corliss and Elise Carter. So um, I don't know if, um, if Slim has actually joined us yet. So I thought since um, he's on, but not on the, the screen, what we'll do is I'll start by showing a, a brief clip of one of his um, performances on Pose. Um, so hold on one second, I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm going to, oh, there he is. Wait, I'll wait. <laughs> okay. So the technology. <laughs> technology, technology, technology. <laughs> it's a thing, isn't it? <laughs> and if you'd like, you can start, you can call back in and try again or
one of the things I am enjoying about this is that um, I'm not the only one who has trouble with technology. And, and, um, and Jason had said that where they are in New York, there's a, an issue with um, Wi-Fi. And I think that's um, an issue that many of us um, experience in different parts of the, um, in different parts of Hartford and, and so on. I know recently um, our youth team got their, um, um, some members of our youth team got their computers from the school. And then once school was over, they had to put them back. So I think, you know, access to resources is, is a really pretty big um, deal um, for folks. And so trying to get, fortunately, um, Jason has all the um, bells and whistles to try to put it back on. Um, oh. Yay, we can hear you. I was trying to connect my AirPods, but that's Mission Impossible 7 right now. So I'm uh, going <laughs> to stick so to the welcome. original. Hi. Hi, I'm so glad you're here. I know it's a pleasure to finally meet you. Yeah. Not in <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you want to, I have the, um, the, the scene that we talked about sort of queued up on Netflix. Do you want to set the stage a little bit? I mean, I think everybody watches Pose, but just in case. Yeah, this is the episode after um, we've lost Candy and sort of, I'm trying to recall what happens. I think it's a moment, yes, where my mother Electra is really feeling herself a little bit too violently and is wanting to set the stage for a hammer to hit Damon's foot so he can stop voguing, or I think for one of us to win the grand prize. In Lamar's brain, I'm like, it doesn't matter because I'm gonna, we're gonna win. But she <laughs> all the precautions. So that's kind of this moment of hearing her plan and me doubting it. Like, should we go along with this or should I say something? Great. All right, hold on a second. Let me get in there. otherwise known as my future best friend. While I was praying for guidance, how best to help dare Ricky, a single question kept appearing in my mind. WWCD. <laughs> what would Candy do? She was not a thinker. She did not have the capacity to ruminate on a problem. She took action, which is what we are going to do. Her prized possession. And if she were here, she would use it. Came on motherfucking foot. It's the only way to ensure Ricky's victory and to my top the sunbathing vacation in Capri with Miss Bentley. So you want us to just stroll up on David and smash him in the foot? Do I have to explain everything? You get close and then you throw it at his foot as hard as you can, and in the chaos that follows, Try and say how sorry you are that you had just applied Vaseline intensive care lotion to your hands and the hammer slipped out of them. Seriously? How are we going to aim a hammer like that? Candy, finally. I'm not comfortable with this. Ricky is good. He can win on his own. No, I will not risk failure. This is too important to this house. Then why don't you do it? Oh, shit. <laughs> As an added incentive, whoever throws the hammer gets to accompany me to Madonna's birthday party. <laughs> there's, right. there's, there's one more portion. Oh, there's one more portion? All right, let me go back there. As soon as I finish uh, talking to Blanca, that'd be perfect. Sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> stop too soon. Hold on a second. I'm just trying to get out of there now. All right. So what, um, what inspired you to pursue dancing and acting? Well, it's funny. I was going to St. Agnes Boys High School, and that's where I kind of found my first um, 
branch of being creative. I joined the drama club and I was doing Shakespeare. I was doing 12 Angry Men. Just um, learning to be creative while figuring out my identity and my identity, my cre creativity helped fortify my path to finding my identity. Mm -hmm. So then I went to I went to audition for SUNY Purchase, hoping to be an actor. Those are my birds. They sometimes fly around and do whatever they want. <laughs> um, and I got denied. I tried for the Conservatory of Acting. Then I went to SUNY Brockport. And then during this time is when I first saw dance, like six hours away, up, upstate, away from the city. And I fell in love with it. I saw this um, duet in a dance concert. One of my friends, she was a dance major and invited me to watch. And I was just captivated of a form of expression. Me being an only child, you know, queer Latino in Washington Heights with no resources, to be honest, of someone helping me and guiding me on what it meant for me to be queer, for me to be gay, for me to be me. I didn't have any of this. So finally finding a form of expression, um, I jumped on it. I, I, I was so obsessed. I came back to the city and I took ballet classes. Then I transferred into SUNY Purchase and um, that's where I was like, okay, this is where I can train. Mm -hmm. And they allowed me to take classes and I tried twice to get into their conservatory and they denied me two more times but they still allow me to take classes. So I kept just, I'm like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. It's those moments where you sit and ask yourself like, do you want to dance? Or do you want to do whatever you're pursuing? And I told myself, yes. And then Benny Ninja came and he taught a Vogue workshop at Purchase. And that was the jumpstart of ballroom and voguing for my yeah. entire life. Yeah. And he allowed me to then come take classes in the city. I went to Balls for the first time, and then two years after college, joined House of Ninja, and that's where I just stamped myself in in dance. Like, mm -hmm. I'm in a house, I better learn how to really Vogue. <laughs> and I just continued my training. I kept taking ballet, kept taking modern. I just kept allowing myself to spend an hour and a half in a space where I can craft an art that allowed me to express who I was. Mm -hmm. Since I didn't have the resource, this was my first sense of a resource mm -hmm. um, that wasn't queer based. So it was a, it was a road. Yeah, it was a road. <laughs> but what's, your, at 18, uh, what's your favorite or, or most difficult, what's the most difficult Vogue move you've mastered? I would probably think the click. A click is very like signature when you put your arms all the way behind your back. Um, at first I couldn't do it. And then I went to go visit Benny. Um, and he's like, you can do it. I'm like, Benny, I can't do it. He's like, you can do it. So it's pretty much when you, I'm trying to prop my, I need to do that. Ooh, wow. <laughs> wow. You like, almost I, dislocate your shoulders. <laughs> well, you know, just a little bit, just move it wow. to the <laughs> so I know there's a lot of youth that are watching um, right now. Um, what advice do you have for them, you know, especially people that are thinking about drag and performance and, and dancing? What advice do you have for them about, you know, sort of setting and pursuing goals? Think of what you are missing in your journey, in your, in your road, what wasn't what you didn't have as a support system and think how could you be the next person to create that? So really instilling up upon your queer co-colleagues, your friends, your chosen family, really listening to, um, you know, elderly queer individuals who may have had the same path as you and they're telling you these stories. So you now have a tool prepared for, you know, any experience you might, my experience positive or negative so really listening to people's stories mm -hmm. and for me i feel like my my main thing i want to hit queer youth with is textbooks and stories like what you don't can't read in school be the next person to write it so someone else can read it. Mm -hmm. so i feel like a conversation i've had a lot is like we don't have queer textbook we don't have queer history we're just mm -hmm. waiting for that person to write it no one in that system is going to write it because it would have been written. 
Mm-hmm. So it's, I feel like it's up to the queer youth to write about queer history, write queer stories. Don't get just stuck on drag race, on pose, like write the next, the next thing that'll elevate our community. So mm-hmm. really looking at all the tools and facets that you have and create something new with it. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, I can hear the birds in the background. What kind of birds do you have? They're sunset conures and they just, they're just li- watching me. They're like, why is the window open? Who are you talking to there? <laughs> <laughs> and you don't worry about them flying out the window? My mom does. She's always like, close the window, but they, they're yeah. not. You know? <laughs> they're like, if I leave that window, I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where all the food is. So. <laughs> right, so I'm staying right here. They got to get that. So what's next for you in your career, Jason? That's a good question. I mean, my next roads were obviously season three of Pose, which has been uh-huh. suspended, but to be continued. Um, Has it started filming yet? We started filming uh, before this pandemic, and then mm-hmm. we had to suspend and stop. Yeah. We're just waiting, you know, for what we all have to wait for, you know, mm-hmm. a cure, a vaccine, and access to allow us to figure out our new normalcies. Yeah. Um, so we're just waiting on that. So thankfully it's not just, we're not having a season three. We just have to wait for um, a, a better time to be able to go back into filming. Yeah. Um, I was working on trying to open a dance studio in Washington Heights. So that's like still a plan. I'm like born and raised in Washington Heights. Uh-huh. And I felt like since it took me so long to bridge dance into my ro- into into I guess my journey, I would love to build a dance studio in my community. So that uh-huh. way still more creative outlets to the community out here. Um, what else, what else? I mean, just a lot of voguing here and there. A couple things I guess I can't say yet. Yeah. Um, you know, just just trying to stay, um, trying to take it day by day and see what it, what is to bring. It's so hard to say what's planned right now. Right. Because all our plans are just. Mm-hmm. How are you keeping body and soul together during all of this? And I've been taking Pilates, I've been taking ballet, I've taught mm-hmm. my own bow classes. So when I teach these bow classes, I'm working out and I'm also encouraging people to be at home and work out as well for an mm-hmm. hour. And I think that's, you know, it's really beautiful. Like people now can access Vogue from wherever they want. So right. now like I have more people in my living room slash studio, but they're just not here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just dance, especially the youth. I'm like, if you were ever scared to take a dance class, this is when you should take it because nobody can watch you. You can hear, you know, you can ask questions, you can mm-hmm. hear the advice, but no one, you don't have to feel nervous about being in that space because you're right. in your own. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. Um, I'm just going to look up at my wife and ask her if um, any questions have come in. Hey, why? Oh, okay, so... Um, <laughs> Um, she said they've been having issues, so I guess we are still having tech, um, tech stuff. Um, so um, what else What else would you want people to know um, about you? I think one of the things, I have another question. The, um, you know, so much of, of queer history, the, the stuff like the, the books that you get and stuff is so white, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's such a rich... Um, um, I mean, all of the foundation of, of Stonewall <laughs> is, you know, queer youth of color, right? So um, black and brown kids who, who really, and especially trans and non-binary kids. So, um, you know, what, what do you see as possible for queer kids of color now that wasn't maybe as a visible, um, you know, before, before Pose and before um, the the houses became more, um, you know, kids out in the, the, the larger community um, having access to that. Anybody, any thoughts about that? You know, it's funny. I feel like we still, being queer and being black and brown, we're still part of black and brown communities. Yeah. So in that sense of your family, like, do they know the resources that you need being black, brown, queer, trans? I feel like that's the, a big, a huge issue. I can't really say my parents supported me at all in what I needed in my identity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. And so people are having like, you know, places where there's all of this, um, 
Okay. Um, there's all of this stuff that, that you know, is, is everything that's happening with George Floyd and, and, the, and the Black Lives Matter, and that I was thinking, and then that the Supreme Court stuff, you know, I was sort of thinking, like, so for, for black and brown queer kids, the Supreme Court stuff was like, yay, cool. So a one part of my identity, you know, I got some new rights and responsibilities, but the other core part of my identity is being murdered in the street. Like, how do you manage those two, um, how do you manage both of those parts of yourself in space where sometimes families don't support you on one end, and then, you know, the white community, queer community doesn't support you on the other end? That was one of the things that Pose also showed was some of the conflict. That's what shows the beauty of houses, of chosen families. Yeah, exactly. Being that you have people, black, other black and brown people that you've chosen as family and friends. Yeah. And those people to have the conversations with, to vent to, mm-hmm. um, having a black and brown queer muse, trans muse that you can look up and listen to them speak and allow their words to be your sword and shield in these moments. Mm-hmm. And it's funny you talk about like, you know, a couple textbooks and we don't, that um, that they're all white, really thinking, finding the, the writers that are black and brown. Like we do have books by Janet Mock. She has two books like Redefining Real, Realness and Surpassing Certainty. And I'm not trans. So, but for me to be a queer Latino and, you know, cis male, to read these books still expands upon me and Mm -hmm. how to approach trans people, what to say, not to say. So I would say books like that. There's another one by George Johnson that I think it's called All Boys Aren't Blue. I just got it, but I heard him have um, a webinar speak and then I got Mm -hmm. his book. So really in a place where you don't see the books that you wanna hear in your library, that's where you have to look up the artists. So it still kind of gives that underground rawness, like ballroom. There mm-hmm. are artists, authors and artists out there. You just have to find them to really right. support you in these moments right. where on one side you're being supported, the other one you're attacked. How do I deal with my day-to-day faith mm-hmm. seeing all this on social media? I just think knowledge, creativity, mm-hmm. conversations mm-hmm. and debates. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, um, we're, we're running close on time. So a couple of things. One, how would people, if they wanted to take your Vogue classes, how would people find you to do that? People wanted me to say that the Instagram's about to time out too. So if you're on the GSA Instagram page, go over to, um, I, I was teaching, um, on Give Me Dance. So you can find me on Give Me Dance. Give Me Dance. Yep. Keep looking on my Instagram, slim.extravaganza, and I should be yeah. having classes again on my Instagram or I'll post any classes that I teach there. Great. So, you are welcomed. Thank I'm you. Teacher, just swoop through. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. It was really great talking to you. Congratulations on your um, your career. And um, it's, you know, and, and I wish you absolutely the most success possible ever um, for season three and all the things that you have in the in the pipeline for it coming up for you because you're an amazing person. Thank you and thank you for True Colors and hopefully we can meet one day in person. Yeah, that would be really cool. That would maybe next year we'll be able to actually do it in person. Yes, not six feet or six feet, whatever, we'll figure right. it out. <laughs> exactly. All right, Jason, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. You. Bye-bye. All right, I'm going to be admitting to the, that was Jason Rodriguez from um, Pose. He's also doing his own dance class. Um, and um, right, Jason, thank you so hey. much. Hey. <laughs> so hold on a second, everybody. I'm going to introduce you in a second. Um, okay. So I'm going to mute Nicole because it's a little early for her yet. Um, but we just finished up with Jason Rodriguez. And, nice. And so um, um, it was, it, it, in some ways, it's kind of an exciting um, connection to the next conversations that we're going to be doing. Okay. So, um, um, and, and I'll tell you why in a second, but um, pl- I please welcome to the, the, um, our conversation today. Um, we have Sarah Prager. Um, Sarah is an author. Um, I have people's biographies here. You know, I gotta, I gotta read this stuff. <laughs> 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 Sarah's an author and an activist. Um, she shares queer history with the world through her fr- free mobile app, Quist, which is cool, and her widely acclaimed book for young adults, Queer There and Everywhere. Her next 
book, Rainbow Revolutionaries, came out or comes out? Came out. Okay. Right, came out in May. Um, also joining us is Maggie C. from the Woods. Um, yep. <laughs> I can see that Maggie's an artist, activist, dancer, writer, and educator committed to community and social change. She was involved in True Colors as a young adult growing up in Connecticut. Her career in arts and activism includes founding and directing The Femme Show, a touring variety show about queer femininity, and co-producing Dancing Queerly, a dance festival for the LGBT community. And then uh, Regina Dighton, my friend forever, uh, mm -hmm. is, um, like, I don't even know where to start with it, with a bio for, for Regina. She's a writer, she's a, a performer, um, she runs a, a, a program that protects children from sexual abuse. She um, helped um, create something, a program called Project Hope, which focuses on um, trans women of color. Um, she's been a, she started the True Colors mentoring program back in the day. Um, that that her history of activism and um, and social justice um, is as long as the day is long. So I'm going to um, leave it at that point. And I, I asked everybody. Um, to join us today because all of the, the folks that are in this panel have a number of um, uh, videos up on our YouTube service. Um, Regina's got two, uh, Maggie's got two, Sarah's got one. And so I just wanna ask you to talk a little bit about the videos that are up there okay. and encourage people to watch them. Uh, Regina, do you wanna start? Sure, and I wanna apologize in advance. I could only be with you long enough to do that. But I just gotta, gotta go. Thank you so much. But yeah, two things up. So the first one is, I don't know which is first, the first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, Journey Writers, which is a writing group to which I belong. And um, the Journey Writers are having a discussion on queer black culture. Mm -hmm. And we have that from the perspective of being writers and talking about um, one, how we think queer black culture has informed the culture at large, uh, black and other colors, but then also how do we as black queers reflect um, black culture? And like an example I give is like, when I see the balls from the twenties on in, I see church, I see the Pentecostal <laughs> church, we just like, took it there and put it in the ball. Um, so I think we are uh, best known locally, not that we're famous, but we're best known locally for a show that I suggested and initiated. And it's been the only one that people ask for year after year. And it's a show called Queer Black History. It's every February, 2021. There'll be more you know, information at the end in terms of website and all that other stuff but we uh, portray various black folk um, in queer history and uh, yeah, speak for them there. The other thing that we've got up is an interview with our community advocate. So the other thing we've got up is my job. Okay, let me switch hats. <laughs> so, <laughs> now I'm speaking to you as the director of community health and well-being at St. Francis Hospital. And in there, I one of the things I do is operate the Family Advocacy Center, which serves victims of crime. We kind of grew from uh, serving children officially, but of course children always come with adults. So we just said, okay, it's family advocacy and we're dealing with people who are victims of crime. And Project Hope is one that targets uh, populations that are victimized more frequently, but served or responded to appropriately less frequently. Mm -hmm. um, transgender women of color is one of those groups. I'll name the others because they intersect. Now I'll let it go, they intersect a lot. So there's transgender women of color, and then we have people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if folks know it, but among the general population, the rate of disability is 20%. Amongst queer folks, it's 30%. I didn't know that. And it's higher if you're Black. So it's nice to go together like, whoa. So the other one, you know, which once again is the intersection, Jamaica women, 
and uh, other Caribbean women, Jamaican, because that's Hartford's uh, population, immigrants and refugees. Um, certainly, once again, um, goes in there with, um, with tr uh, trans women of color. And then finally, though many wouldn't admit it, Muslim women. Yeah, that's in there too, yeah. Um, and there's some folks who do admit, you know, support and really work toward it, but they're uh, really challenged. So those are the groups that we will hear from. Raven, um, who is the community advocate for transgender women of color. Right. Thank you so much, Regina. And you're, you're welcome. welcome. One of the pieces that um, that Jason brought up, because he was talking about ball culture, is um, you know ball culture and chosen family, and I do yes. think chosen family also is a part of black culture, um, and that and that there's a long history of aunties and and you know yes. that are that are chosen family as opposed to necessarily blood family, and and I think that's one of that kind of intersections between queer and black. Oh. Absolutely, I say absolutely. And the strictness of the house parents. Right. That is your down yeah. south parent. You do exactly what I say. Or as my mother used to say, when I tell you to do something, I mean quick, fast, and in a hurry. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's the strict Thanks. mother. All That's right. Good. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. See you later. Bye bye. Uh, Maggie, do you want to, while we, we have you, while you have, um, um, access yes yeah it's it's it's, it's not bad you? um i think i'm coming through okay yes you are you're good all right so um i have two videos up right now one is ballet is for everyone um which is a little mini version of a workshop that i've taught in person at true colors before and at a number of other lgbtq youth conferences and events um and it's really just a f very fun approach to ballet in the spirit of let's reclaim something that's not always friendly to queer people and to non-white people and let's find a way to move our bodies because all different kinds of bodies need to move and um and this and I think it's really important for us as humans to find ways to move our bodies that we enjoy um so that's my first offering. Um, and then if today, today is culture day. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I have a one woman show. I have a half hour excerpt of it up on the true colors channel. It's called ladies at a gay girls bar, 1938 to 1969. Um, and it goes back and forth between a number of femme characters in a sort of, uh, like, archetypical like not a specific place necessarily but in a in a sort of working class women's gay bar um sometime between world war ii and stonewall um in america um and it goes back and forth between those historical characters and which are based on research but kind of fictionally written mm -hmm. to give trying to give kind of an emotional component that i feel like we don't always get from um traditional history mm -hmm. Um, and it weaves between that and actually my experiences as a young person starting to discover queer history. And, and it also kind of delves into the messages that I happened to be getting around femininity when I was um, a young person in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and sort of like at, at its root, I think part of what it's about is actually about um, the roots of anti-femme misogyny in queer and lesbian women's communities mm -hmm. um yeah that's the short version <laughs> yeah that's great thanks maggie um, thank Sarah, you and it's interesting because that's a, a, a portion of his, a very specific kind of portion of history and then sarah you did sort of a broader um look at queer history do you want to talk about your video yeah um so my video that i have up is amazing stories from queer history from around the world. Um, it focuses on the stories of six mm -hmm. uh, real life individuals, including the inventor of the computer and the inventor of the high five, um, a person of Swedish royalty that 
gave up the throne and everything to be able to live authentically. Um, and a trans doctor from a hundred years ago who helped flatten the curve of another infectious disease that was the leading cause of death in the U S at the time. And so, um, wow. it really just, it's like my books, it's, um, sharing, um, a diverse array of stories of real people from queer history that hopefully youth can feel connected to and mm -hmm. see themselves reflected in and, um, see as role models to be able to achieve the same kinds of things in their lives. Yeah, that's so great. Um, yeah. And so um, several people have already begun watching the videos. They've been up um, for a while, but I thought it would be really fun to just highlight um, these ones that are really specific to our culture and our history. And that, you know, I think maybe six or seven years ago, um, um, the person who was running our youth leadership stuff um, did a survey of the the um, the gender and sexuality alliances, the GSAs. Mm -hmm. Asked them if they knew who Matthew Shepard was. Mm. Less than half of the young people had any had any idea who he was, and so that was a seminal event for a certain generation in a way that pulse is a seminal event for, you know, the next generation and, and, um, yeah. um, and the way George Floyd is a seminal yeah. um, event. And so um, I think that giving, having a context, having a history, seeing role models and people who are like you who have made a difference in the world makes a difference. It gives us, yeah. a, it gives people the, the idea that they can be whoever they wanna be. Yeah. You can make a difference. I I think it's a good point that uh, knowing that there is history behind the, the historical context of today's events mm -hmm. really matter because um, when you see the reaction to George Floyd's murder, if that was the first time something like that had ever happened in American history, the reaction might not have been the same. But with a historical context, we know it is absolutely far from mm -hmm. the first, it's not an isolated event. And so mm -hmm. that really matters. And when we look at events of our generation, like Pulse, it matters to remember things like the Upstairs Lounge um, and intentionally set arson at a New Orleans um, gay bar that um, killed many people inside. And um, that's when we can start to understand systemic oppression and then use that to be able to dismantle it. Because we can also look at the activism of the past and learn from the, um, you know, Stonewall was a, a violent riot, mm -hmm. um, not one of the many nonviolent moments um, of our history. We also have Bayard Rustin in our history mm -hmm. who was a champion of nonviolence and mm -hmm. Uh, organized the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where the I Have a Dream speech was delivered by Dr. King. And so we can learn from all kinds of activism that's already been done and figured out and tested and seen what works. And I think one of the things in our histories that we see again and again is when um, oppressed groups work together instead of fight against each other um, and lift each other up. Um, instead of discriminate against each other is when we make the most progress. And so we saw that in now excluding queer women and, you know, that ended up hurting them instead of helping them and the women's movement and things like that. So, um, yeah, my, my new book is um, for a younger crowd it's 8 to 12 it's a middle grade book so um it shares those stories in a bit of a different way than my teen book queer there and everywhere but they both I share love the title, by the stories way. of individuals okay all right thank you so much maggie thank you sarah um yep. welcome back mel um, um so we're gonna move on to uh, talking about chibi Con. Right now, because everything that we've been talking about is different elements of queer culture today. 
and uh, and Shibikon is one of the unique elements of um, of queer culture, um, both drag and anime, and you know, like, and I'm actually Mel is way better at explaining this than I am. So uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to them. Thank you very much. All right. Um, Thank you. Joining us, and um, and we'll see you again. Thank you. Yes. So Mel, one question I have for you is, um, do you want to show the video, the dance video first, and then um, talk, introduce the Q and A, or do you want to um, introduce the Q and A? And you know, how, what, do you have an order that you'd like to do it in? If we have time for both, I feel like the dance video is a good introduction to what they do, and it will give you better context. All right, so let me do that. Um, so I'm going to show you the screen, um, and it takes me just a second to to pull this stuff up. So I'm going to do that right now screen. Okay, wait, before I share the screen, I'm going to actually do this and I'm going to bring it up first and then share the screen because that's how that works. <laughs> and you'd think after six weeks, I would. There we go. Uh, we are oh, that's the Q&A. Oh, no, that's the Q&A. Stop. Stop. Sorry. Um, no, it's all good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me go get the other one. Okay. Uh, so chibi-con, for folks who've never heard this before, chibi is a word that people use to mean like cute. It's based on Japanese language and anime and there's a whole lot of cultural stuff that I won't get into. Um, but that's where that word comes from and then con being short for conference, convention, all of that. So you've heard of things like gamer con or whatever. So chibi-con is a play on that and we're about to see why. Right, you're going to see that in right now. I'm going to share my screen, and here we go. And uh, and there. Thank you. 
defenses. My business is priceless and needs a run a tight ship. All right. Um, so do you want to um, introduce the, the next part, Mel? Uh, yeah, so um, ChibiCon, uh, pretty much every year for the past couple of years, has been a guest speaker at our drag nights on Friday nights. And now that we have moved to Zoom, that gave us the benefit of being able to record it. So what you're about to watch is a 10-minute kind of collection of parts of the Q&A session that we had during our Friday night activity. Um, I'm really excited that ChibiCon can be up here. I've known them a long time. I think what they're doing of kind of like combining queer culture and kind of like the nerd geek culture at the same time is really cool. So Chibicon tries really hard to make sure that their shows are accessible. So whenever possible, it's an all ages venue. Whenever possible, they make sure that there are access ramps. Like they make sure that if there are going to be strobe lights, they warn, which is something that I need. So I really appreciate that. Um, so they try really hard and they do a lot of good work. And I guess that's it. Right, we're great. We're delighted to have him here. We're putting information in the, the chat boxes about how to find um, ChibiCon um, on, the, on the web. So let me share their, um, the Q&A um, that they did with, with Mel and, um, and we'll be right and I'll be right back. Here we go. We are Chibicon, the Chibicon, Chibicon, the Chibicon show. <laughs> We're not traveling right now. <laughs> uh, we travel, but we can't stop going out. Yeah, you can see all of our drag. Yeah. <laughs> we rebranded ourselves a little bit. <laughs> so, they got so my name is Nino. I'm the director of Chibicon. Uh, my name is Sarai Lampard, and I am the makeup coordinator. Um, so my pronouns um, as you or as Patrick are both as they are. Uh, my pronouns as Serenity are uh, they, she, and as Danny is he. Um, about five years ago, a little over five years now, and um, and he been great. The beginning, one of the things he wanted to do was have that target of uh, a younger audience, but all these, you know, he wanted to see a show uh, that anybody, whether you were eight years old or 18 years old, anybody more than that, but we usually travel around in when um, we have 
slowly uh, transition from doing, uh, we started with doing a lot of clubs, and then we did clubs and colleges, and then colleges and convention, and we're slowly transitioning to uh, more colleges and universities and conventions.
including Margo and Marissa, checks the large lines. Saturday, I will stay up late performing. But it's a little bit rough. Um, uh, um, yeah, I think I, when I try scheduling, it's like, okay, this week we'll not sleeping, and then next week we'll not sleeping. We have to rotate it that way from the same people, but not like a different way. Well, PT and I are like dancers like that, so we had to work a lot on choreo. As always, <laughs> uh, but specifically us, uh, Veronica and uh, Ruby definitely have uh, a good <laughs> We also have to change um, the way we rehearse because you know when when we're home rehearsing, someone takes it, someone's at it. It is not that big stage as it is in convention, but we make it work, and we grow on. And, and the more we do it, the more we're like red flag. We're not doing that. Gets better. We have grown to make sure that we are inclusive and more inclusive throughout the years and over the years. You know, if our show in any way, whether it's audio, visually, or in any way, if it has shown something that may offend anybody, he has been removed. We're, we're constantly changing with our group and evolving. It is also hard when, like, people are college showing they can only do this day. What happens if that day is some really special day or anything like that? Like, how, like, we're like, well, this is the only day we're doing it, and like, we can't do the show without you. So, you know, sometimes you can't get hard. Of like, uh, what is professionalism and what is friendship? Uh, we get like that line that splits it. I mean, of course, sometimes it gets to be a gray area. And, and, Things there are things that are hard not to take personal. Then you have to have those conversations because we really can move forward. Either you know, the person is not working, the outfit is not coming along, like something. It definitely blocks it in some point of like the community to shut down. Like everybody has to be in the same community. We we'll literally go around and everybody goes and get the same stuff with that. And then that's it. And then we move on. We have to do that or to make it. And it's like it needs to. Working on your own, doing your own thing, you can start your show. Um, and when you're in a room, um, the first thing that kind of has to come is, hey, listen, nobody's Beyonce. Like, you're not Beyonce, I'm not Beyonce, you're in a group. Beyonce. And so that's kind of uh, what kind of the numbers that we can see the first thing that wants to shine. Um, that was like really important. Um, and obviously, like in, in any room or show or anything, the audience that happens, the audience is that they want them to kind of um, have the best of a personal level. But when it comes to us, you're like, you can't be like, oh no, I'm sorry, I need to be in the middle all the time because, you know, um, ego was the first thing I had to go. So thank you so much you. for having us, and um, you'll have a great weekend. All right, let me put my video back on. Hi, well, that was really great. I don't know, Mel, if you want to say um, a last um, piece about that, or do you want to leave it? With the the um, the last co the conversation, so ChibiCon, you saw on the screen how to to reach them. Um, there was a lot of great information about the, not only their work but their values. Do you want to make a last statement uh, before we move on? I mean, that was pretty good. Um, I just I love that they work so hard to make things youth inclusive because I think a lot of us who kind of promote and support queer culture can forget that it's not always youth friendly or youth inclusive. Right. So working hard to make sure that the venues and the content and everything are that I think mm -hmm. is really important. So that was why I thought they should be the group that we kind of use to highlight drag. Right, great. Thank you so much, Mel. I really appreciate that. And don't forget you all to check out uh, Queer Academy on the web. Um, it is now my honor <laughs> to invite into the um, our space um, Nicole Talbot, um, and I'm gonna read this, Nicole, because I think it's really great. And so, do you wanna, well, I thought what we would do is I would read the, the thing and then we would play your performance and then come back and talk to each other. Does okay. that work for you? That works. 
All right, so Nicole Talbot is a singer and musical theater, theater actress with Broadway aspirations. She's a rising freshman at Boston Conservatory at Berkeley and is pursuing a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in musical theater. Nicole found her voice and passion on stage, performing in more than 35 productions since age five, including Les Miserables, Into the Woods, A Year with Frog and Toad. She recently appeared as Martha Cratchit in North Shore Music Theater's production of A Christmas Carol. She's a proud Actors Equity membership candidate. Um, she is a national anthem singer for the Boston Bruins and performed the anthem as part of the NHL's Hockey for Everyone campaign at TD Gardens for 19,000 fans and millions of viewers. Um, and some folks in our audience um, also know Nicole for um, her efforts on behalf of uh, transgender youth. And we'll talk about that more after the performance. So I'm going to um, uh, just take a second to pull up um, um, Nicole's performance. And then, hold on one second. And then, Here we go. So Nicole, what is the song? Say the name of the song. The song is called I Dare You by uh, Kelly Clarkson. Great, thank you so much. Here we go. Just like 
Outstanding. Thank you very much. That's not an easy song to sing either. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't tell us a little bit about yourself, Nicole. Yeah. Um, but we know about your, you know, some of your aspirations and stuff, but tell us, how, how do you, just tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I mean, um, my journey started um, on September 10th, 2001. Um, and, you know, throughout my childhood, I always knew that I wasn't the stereotypical boy. Um, uh -huh. Even though I still played with like things like trains and things like that, um, my trains didn't crash. They had tea parties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, throughout my life, there were all of these defining moments where I, I really stood up for myself and became became myself and one of those moments was in kindergarten when I um my mom had bought me a elephant costume for a Halloween parade um and when it came time to do the Halloween parade I proudly walked down the stairs um in a princess dress heels and a crown um and that was kind of really one of the first moments where I I defied the expectations of of being a boy um and eventually when I did transition in seventh grade um you know I had huge support from my friends and family in my school um my dad was not one of those people um but the things that have happened to me and the struggles that I feel everyone in this community has gone through at some point or another um makes us stronger and the, those scars make us who we are um, and make us better for them. And when I did transition, I very quickly came into working with the Yes on Three campaign and Freedom for All Massachusetts to mm -hmm. pass and protect legislation here in Massachusetts, um, uh, defending or protecting transgender people in public accommodations. Um, and I really feel like I found my voice fairly early on through my advocacy, but also through my singing. And mm -hmm. it, they both played major roles in, and I think me becoming who I am today. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of who I have become despite mm -hmm. um, the struggles and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. What are you looking forward to about school? Have you heard yet whether you're going to be able to go in person? Yeah. So my school is going to be doing a hybrid program, okay. um, which I think will be really good to have um, a smooth transition into college life. Yeah. So it'll be sort of a, um, um, is that Berkeley, where, Berkeley in California or Berkeley uh, in Boston? Okay, great. All right. So, and actually you live in Massachusetts, right? So you'll be able to, yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Um, what do you hope your first year there is going to be like? Um, I hope I'm going to be able to, and I kind of know that I'm going to be able to hone not only my, my vocal craft, but um, <laughs> my, my, my craft as a person and becoming, um, and learning more and more about myself and about the world around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and college really is an opportunity to to really explore and figure out who you are in ways that you know as as wonderful it is as it is you know growing up and 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 having support from your mom is one of your biggest um, one of your biggest fans, and um, you know that's great. And you know also being you know sort of a little bit away. Um, I'll never forget, and this is, I shouldn't tell you the story, but no, I'm never, never mind. I'll tell you later. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, um, but that's really, that's really exciting. And I think that, you know, that, that you've been, you know, an amazing, continue to be an amazing role model um, for young people about persistence and, and, um, and resilience. Um, and you're, you success, you know, very successfully have integrated these different parts of your life. So that there's a balance, you know, between um, your love of music and your activism, and you're able to to really be a whole person in that. Um, and 
a, a lot of people do say that music is the is a universal language and and I do feel that way that even if you don't understand the words you can still feel the emotion through music and um, feel the meaning and you know my advocacy work you know it, it took me from Massachusetts and then it took me to the gender cool project and the human mm -hmm. rights campaign um, and you know being on national television and speaking in front of thousands of people mm -hmm. and it's I, I would have never thought that and and this year um at the end of june i accepted the trans community visionary award from congratulations the, thank you from the trans club of new england and you know me as a little six-year-old like or even younger i never thought that I would even make it to becoming myself, mm -hmm. becoming Nicole. And, and it's, I, I've exceeded my own expectations that I thought were even possible mm -hmm. um, for someone in, in the trans community. Yeah. Yeah, that's really wonderful, Nicole. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing your talent. And, um, and we wish you just a great um, uh, experience at college. And we can't wait to see what's next um, for you. All right. Thank you very much. We'll talk again soon. We're going to check in next year because I want to see how your first year went. <laughs> and then I'll tell you that story. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Nicole. Bye. Okay, so we're, we're, we're winding down um, and we've got uh, one more performance by the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus. I'm gonna show that in, in just a minute. Um, I wanna just take a quick second to say, um, you know, that this, this has been such an honor to do this. Um, um, and so I've enjoyed it very much. I hope that you've enjoyed um, all the different things that we were able to put together. Um, for you for this and that you'll continue to, you know, subscribe to our, our YouTube channel, that you'll apply to Queer Academy, which is going to be off the hook this year, um, and that you'll continue to be your great, wonderful, lovely, amazing queer selves <laughs> and ally. Um, so hold on one second. I've got to do this little piece here to go back and get um, the, the song. Here it is. And I just need to push that for a second. And go back over here. The sad part is I'm now getting really good at like moving around in here and then it's over. <laughs> so um, here we go. I'm gonna share my screen and, um, and we're gonna let the gay men's chorus um, take us out of um, our six week mini con series. This is the part I'm not good at because the screen shares in the way. The mission of the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus is to use music as a catalyst to inspire, impact, and enrich the lives of our members, patrons, and the community. In this time of physical distancing, we have not been able to be together. However, we remain committed to supporting one another and the greater community during this crisis. For this virtual choir project, we recorded our separate parts of
All right. Thank you so much to the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus. Um, that was beautiful. And, um, and that song, we have put that up on our, um, our YouTube channel. So if people want to see it again or get the information about how to connect with the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus um, or make a donation to the Hartford Gay Men's Chorus, you know, please uh, feel free to do that. And also, I just put out that, you know, that the Minicon series was totally offered totally free and, um, and made available to everyone at no cost. And so if you like the free um, content, feel free to make a donation to support our work on behalf of LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and for one final time, let me say this, um, True Colors does education and advocacy. No, I don't really do, okay. For gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning, two-spirit, same gender loving, pansexual, sexual, not straight, not labeling, straight edge, straight so far, straight with options, straight stuff happens, gender bending, gender bending, bi-gender, pan-gender, agender, asexual, non-binary, and other sexual and gender minority youth. Good night. <laughs>